Brahmanandam Paramasukadam Kevalam Gyanamurtim Dwanduatitam Gangana Sadrisham Tatuamasya Dilaksham Ekam Nityam Vimalam Achalam Sarvadi Sakshi Bhutam Bhavatitam Trigunarahitam Sadgurum Tam Namami Hello, welcome. Pay very close attention to these teachings. They are from a work of Adi Shankaracharya, Viveka Chudamani, and it is Advaita Vedanta. So this, these are the teachings that you find in the scriptures. They are according to the scriptures. So pay very attention to these teachings. Listen very carefully to these teachings. Then you should reflect upon them reflecting a lot upon these teachings and then meditate upon these teachings so that they may bear fruit in your heart. Moving on from the 10th verse to the 11th. Right action helps to purify the heart, but it does not give us direct perception of reality. The reality is attained through discrimination, but not in the smallest degree, even by 10 million acts. So right actions help to purify the heart, and this is very important. It promotes detachment, it promotes merits that will help it will balance your karmas. So this helps, but it will not, not only through right action, this will not lead you to the ultimate reality. The reality is attained through discrimination. And every actions are connected to the non-Atman, not to the Atman itself. And at some point, these right actions will develop this discrimination so that your time is directed uniquely to Brahman, not to the non-self. Correct discernment shows us the true nature of the rope and removes the painful fear caused by our deluded deluded belief that it is a large snake. So it is quite common this example of the snake and the rope to show how superimposition works, how things to appear to exist and they don't. So this snake on the rope is a perfect example of this. So there's a, a big rope lying on the ground and light is not very present. You can see it, but not clearly. And it's easy to mistake in that rope for a snake. And the turmoil comes with that perception. Once it is clear, once the nature of the rope is revealed, that fear disappears. Sure knowledge of reality is gained only through meditation upon the right teaching and not by sacred ablutions or almsgiving or by the practice of hundreds of breathing exercises. All of these come in the category of these right actions that helps to purify the heart. So sacred ablutions, almsgiving or, or breathing exercises, 
They do elevate your consciousness. They purify body and mind, and this helps. But sure knowledge of reality means direct experience of the reality, direct perception of the reality, and is gained through the right, through meditation upon the right teaching, the teachings given by the awakened one. Because the scriptural teaching needs the awakened one to interpret what's there, to decode what's there. Because your interpretation is conditioned by your state of consciousness. So, like I gave in the previous example, the map, but there's no light for you to see. You don't know even if what is the north part, south part, and, and the rest also. So, not even the position of the map you know, so you don't know where to move. You will be trapped by your misleading understanding. This is why you need the awakened one to give you the right teaching, the right interpretation of scriptures. It's not that the Guru can give the right interpretation of the scriptures, but he gives direct teaching. That is the essence of what is in the scriptures. And it cannot go against them. And if there's something contradicting Two options are there. Either he's not an awakened one, or you're not understanding what he is teaching. But if you judge immediately, you probably will not get access to what the meaning is. But if in a humbled way, you question and you ask, what is this contradiction? And if you're worthy of the explanation, you will get it, and you will see no contradiction there. Because even apparently, uh, scriptures is full of apparent, um, contradicting knowledge, but it isn't. Who is competent? Success in attaining the goal depends chiefly upon the qualifications of the seeker. Suitable time, place, and other circumstances are aids to attainment. This is crucial. This is very important. So, the suitable time and place, even the, the knowing uh, an enlightened master and all of this, this helps. Well, knowing an enlightened master is, is more than the rest. But still, if you don't have the qualifications, you won't be successful. So you need to have these qualifications that will be presented, um, summarized. So understand that if you're not getting there, certain qualifications are missing. So what this means is, it's not what some people interpret like, okay, so I don't have it. No, it means this is what you need to develop next so that success is attained therefore let him who would know the atman which is reality practice discrimination but first he must approach a teacher who is a perfect knower of brahman and whose compassion is vast as the ocean itself it has to be or else well you will not be able to entertain your comings and goings and doubts and all of that. But that's a different thing. <clears throat> so let him who would know the Atman, which is reality, practice discrimination. This is central. Discrimination, because this discrimination allows continue, continuous tuning with Brahman and continuous abstraction from non-Brahman if there is such a thing, but that's another subject. Here, we follow this, and this is very important. But first, let him approach a teacher, the one that brings the light to all of this and makes it fruitful, who is a perfect knower of Brahman. Only Brahman itself is perfectly knower of Brahman, so an enlightened teacher 
the one who has experienced Brahman, who has dissolved his individual consciousness in Brahman, that is the one you should seek. Otherwise, you're changing just one confusion for another. It can be helpful, depending, but we are talking about realization of ultimate reality. A man should be intelligent and learned to study the scriptures, to understand the scriptures, with great powers of comprehension. He must be able to reflect about these teachings, go deep in his reflections, so that he can understand them, or at least develop these tools in a good way. And able to overcome doubts by the exercise of his reason, like I was explaining, being able to reflect on this and come out of the doubts by this mechanism. One who has these qualifications is fit for the knowledge of Brahman. He alone is qualified to seek Brahman who has discrimination whose mind is turned away from all enjoyments. If he has discrimination, meaning not an intellectual or just intellectual discrimination between, because it's always between Atman and non-Atman. So if he has discrimination, it will mean that his mind is turned away from all enjoyments. Who possesses tranquility that has different meanings as we will see and the kindred virtues and who feels a longing for liberation. The longing for liberation is, like I said, the engine and this will always be uh, what will enable you to move beyond what it seems to be possible. So that, that one who has discrimination between Atman and non-Atman has his mind turned away from all enjoyments. If he hasn't his mind turned away from all enjoyments, it is not still discrimination. Or it may at least, at best, be mental, uh, the mental concept of discrimination, but it's not bringing fruit, it's not bringing a new positioning, a new alignment, everything continues the same. So it is nothing. In this connection, the sages have spoken of four qualifications for attainment. Simplifying, of course. When these are present, devotion to the reality will become complete. That means tuning undistractedly from reality. That is one. And another aspect, which is not complete, but it's kind of a side effect, side effect complete abstraction from that which is not Atman, from that which is not eternal. This is devotion to reality. Will become complete. So if these qualifications are there, then it will be successful. When they are absent, it will fail. So if you, ha if you haven't awakened yet, that means these qualifications are not complete. If they are complete, eventually they will be successful. So first is mentioned discrimination between the eternal and non-eternal. This is basis. For this teaching, this is basis of all. And this is only possible with right action and the right abstraction from certain actions. And like I said, discrimination is not a mental concept only. It is an attitude, it is a positioning yourself in, in your life. Let's call it this way for now. Next comes renunciation of the enjoyment of the fruits of action. Well, 
if you have discrimination between non-eternal and eternal, that means you have renunciated the actions towards that which is non-eternal. But also the renunciation of the fruits of these actions have to be renounced also. Here and hereafter. What does this mean, here and hereafter? It means that these fruits, like I said previously, good fruits, bad fruits, they entangle you in the same way. You are trapped, you are a slave to these fruits and you will have to experience them because they were, those actions were prompt by selfish desire, so it brings fruit. So renunciation, renouncing these fruits, good or bad, here and hereafter is very important. The hereafter is after the, the death of the physical body, many times these good fruits, you will have to go experiencing them in these higher realms of existence, which is called heaven in uh, Western culture, for example. And when those fruits end, you come back again and you continue your journey. So renouncing these fruits is very important so that you make sure that the more experience from this individual character ceases, either in this plane or in others. Then come the six treasures of virtue, beginning with tranquility. And we'll go through all of them. And last is certainly the longing for liberation. It has to be there intensely, like I've explained, is the engine of it all. <clears throat> Brahman is real. The universe is unreal. And firm conviction of this, of this is so, is called discrimination between eternal and non-eternal. Who is going to waste time with that which is unreal? No one. So, when this conviction is there, your attention moves completely to that which is eternal and let's go of that which is not eternal. We will also talk about that in a very profound way. Renunciation is the giving up of all the pleasures of the eyes, the ears, and other senses. So all the pleasures you get from what is called sense pleasures, you get from the senses, the taste, the smell, the, the sight, the, the hearing and the touch, all these pleasures have to be renounced. Because experiencing these pleasures without renouncing them, it is affirming that which is non-eternal. The giving up of all objects of transitory enjoyment. So all objects that are experienced through these senses, of, again, that are a source of transitory enjoyment have to be, has to be renounced. The giving up of the desire for a physical body also, as well as the highest kind of spirit body of a God. There are those who aspire to these things, to these higher places, to these higher roles, a role of a deity, of a God, and this also needs to be renounced for liberation's sake. And also this kind of a body, a new birth or the maintenance of this one, this needs to be renounced as well. It is non-eternal. To detach the mind from all objective, objective things by continual continually seeing their imperfection and to direct it steadfastly towards Brahman. This goal, this is called tranquility. 
So detaching your mind from all objective things, as we were talking previously. By continuous seeing their imperfection. This is the exercise of discrimination. Is this eternal? Is this everlasting? Is this pleasure eternal? Is this everlasting? Is this real? Is this Brahman? No. Detaching. So by, by this observation of whatever is coming from within, all these impulses to invest, is this concerning Brahman the eternal or that which is non-eternal? So detaching, as the mind is getting engaged in the objective things, detach it immediately by observing their nature. To detach both kinds of sense organs, those of perception and those of action, from objective things, and to withdraw them to the rest in their respective centers, this is called sense control. There are many ways to observe this. One is energetically. As you are meditating, you are abstracting, you're removing the the, prana, the pranic currents back to their source. So this is withdrawing. But intellectually speaking, all these sense organs and that which gives prompts action from them. So detaching from this And by detaching, they will be withdrawn to their place of rest. Like attention, when you're meditating, for example, a thought comes, attention moves. When you let go of the object, attention goes to a place, rests in a place. So does these, uh, the senses, the sense organs, perception and action, it happens also. So we are, when they are disengaged, and if you detach yourself from them, they get disengaged and they rest at their source. We could go into energetic uh, centers and all of that, but no need. <clears throat> Again, continue, it's the same verse. We are going through what, what is uh, tranquility. True mental poise consists in not letting the mind react to external stimuli. This is complicated while there is cravings present. Because there is cravings present, there will be reactions towards that which you want and towards that which you don't want. There will be aversion, craving and aversion. And both, both. They take you out of equanimity. So you have to remove both to have equanimity. So not only not reacting to that which you consider to be bad by letting this, it's bad, but also, wow, nice, good. The mind is fluctuating, getting agitated. So not reacting to these external objects it is equanimity. To endure all kinds of afflictions without any reaction, complaint or lament, this is called forbearance. And this is very important. That strength we talked in the beginning, that is mentioned in the beginning, has to evolve to this level of strength, conquering a state where Whatever afflictions are there, your mind continues steady, doesn't react, doesn't try to change circumstances, doesn't have any reaction, doesn't complain, lament. This is called forbearance, and it's very important not to be dragged by that which is non-eternal. If you don't have it, whenever circumstances become too bad or too good, you lose stability of the mind so that 
att continuous attention is impossible. <clears throat> A firm conviction based upon the intellectual understanding that the teachings of the scriptures and of one's master are true. This is called by the sages the faith that leads to realization of reality. So it is a firm conviction based upon intellectual understanding. Because if there's not the direct experience of Brahman, only what you're left is an intellectual understanding. Because there's nothing else you can grasp. And there, there are, like you, many through thousands of years of seekers walking the path of the scriptures and by reaching its end, confirming their words in one way or another. So this firm conviction and the conviction in the teachings of your master, they are very important because if this is not there, you will be in the middle judging. In the beginning, it's important for you to ascertain um, that you're in the right place. And once that certainty comes, you have to abide by it, because if you don't, your mind will take you away from that with doubt and you will collapse. <clears throat> so this is called faith. To trust completely in the teachings of the scriptures and your master's clarity of the scriptures and of its own self-realization. To concentrate the intellect always upon the pure Brahman and keep it fixed there always. This is called self-surrender. This doesn't mean soothing the mind like a baby with idle thought, thoughts like saying, oh, I'm Brahman, I'm Brahman, and just that, and continuing the rest. Because if you don't have the, the previous conditions and if you're not uh, developing them, it will be impossible to maintain the concentration of intellect, which is a higher faculty, as we will see. You will be trapped in lower mind, just with agitation, restlessness, and that cannot concentrate in something a long time. And of course, it is called self-surrender, because you have to surrender to Brahman, and uh, and letting go of everything else for this to become possible. We could speak, we could talk more about surrender, but in this context, so let's keep it this way. The longing for liberation is the will to be free from the feathers of ignorance. Beginning with the ego sense and so on, down to the body itself through the realization of one's true nature, of course. To be free from the feathers of ignorance only through self-realization. And it is the longing for liberation that can enable this to be possible. Because you don't want ignorance anymore. In other words, you don't want non-Atman anymore. You just want Atman, the truth, liberation, eternal. This is what you want. And the intensity of this longing for this, it, it will what will enable you to act more concisely, more promptly, more focused, without any um, without ups and downs in your conviction, more or less beginning with the ego sense and so on, down towards the physical body. We will, this work addresses all these stages, we will go there. Hmm. Okay, so even though this longing for liberation may be present in a slight or moderate degree. It will grow intense through the grace of the teacher, of the Guru. 
and through the practice of renunciation of and of such virtues as tranquility, not only having them, but continuously practicing them, perfecting them, and renunciation, of course. So the grace of the teacher, the practice of renunciation, and the virtues as tranquility will increase the longing for liberation, which is present, if it is in a mild degree, in a soft or low or moderate, it will increase it exponentially. And like this it will bear fruit. When renunciation and the longing for liberation are present to an intense degree within a man, then the practice of tranquility and other virtues will bear fruit and lead to the goal. When this renunciation is not present at a strong degree, an intense degree, it means that worldly actions are still being undertaken, so there is contact with the objects, its sense pleasures, there is entanglement with them, because if you're investing them, you're entangled, and the rest is not possible. If, they are, if this renunciation is intense, if you have abstracted from all of that, then the practice of tranquility, as has been explained, see again, will be not only possible, but also will bear the thought on fruits and lead to the goal, which is realization of Brahman, self-realization. Where renunciation and longing for liberation are weak, tranquility and other virtues are a mere appearance, like a mirage in a desert. So, when this renunciation and the longing for liberation are weak, whenever you're looking at someone that seems to be, that ha seems, appears to have these qualities, many people say, oh, I know someone which is, uh, which has all these virtues and not even a secret of truth, just a common person with these traits. Look how good. Know that this is just a mere appearances. Like a, a mirage, they don't exist really. And only a deep look would reveal that. Let's stop here, continuing the next. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti Shanti Shanti